So having gone through elimination reactions, in this video we're going to go through a specific mechanism for an elimination reaction. And this is called the E1 reaction or the E1 mechanism. And in order to understand the E1 reaction, we're actually just going to have a little flashback to the uh, reaction that you should be familiar with by now, which is the SN1 reaction. Because this is going to be closely related to the SN1 reaction. As we'll see, it actually accompanies the SN1 reaction as well. So if you think back to what actually happens in the SN1 reaction, remember that we usually have a tertiary alkyl halide or some sort. And the slow step or the first step in the SN1 reaction is that the leaving group leaves. Remember the leaving group leaves. And this is a slow step. And we're usually doing our SN1 reaction in the presence of a solvent such as water. And usually it's a, it's a weak, weak base, weak nucleophile. And this will give us a carbocation because we've broken the bond between the carbon and the chlorine. And so this gives us Cl, and we're going to have a lone pair, extra lone pair on our chloride, so Cl minus. And now that we have our carbocation, we have another molecule of water which can come in, and this lone pair from our oxygen can attack the carbocation, and this will form a carbon oxygen bond. So we form carbon oxygen bond let's draw that out here OH2 and we've gone from having one having two pairs of electrons on the oxygen to actually having one so it's going to have now a positive charge and uh, in the last step of the SN1 here in this case we're actually going to lose a proton so we can say minus H plus and that will give us our neutral alcohol like that okay and you know just so that we know what bonds are forming and what bonds are breaking just make sure that we're clear on that we're breaking the carbon to chlorine and we're forming the carbon to oxygen so that makes this an SN1 reaction it's a substitution reaction now this is the major product of the SN1 reaction but when we run this experiment we find that there's a significant amount of a byproduct which has an alkene. So here we have an alkene and like a minor amount, maybe let's say 10%. I'm not going to be exact, it depends on the reaction, but about 10% in this case. And if you think about the bonds that form and break in this process, this has to come also from our tertiary alkyl halide. And if we numbered our carbons here and, and draw everything out, we'd see that we draw in our CH3 hydrogen and hydrogen and we're going to be breaking our carbon to chlorine and we're going to be forming a pi bond between carbon 1 and carbon 2 and we're also breaking a bond between carbon 1 and hydrogen and not only that we're also something has to form a bond to hydrogen if we're breaking a bond to hydrogen. It turns out that we're forming a bond to an oxygen. In this case, we have water. So this is an elimination reaction. Elimination. C1 to C2 pi bond and breaking carbon chlorine carbon hydrogen. Every elimination reaction is going to follow this general pattern where we're forming a pi bond and we're breaking a bond to our leaving group and the carbon hydrogen. So how is it that this alkene forms? That is a great question. And it turns out we have a hypothesis for how this forms. And, and this is going to be the cornerstone of the mechanism we'll draw here. This is going to be how this reaction occurs. So instead of oxygen, a molecule of OH2, attacking the carbocation to form the substitution product, what happens in this mechanism we're going to call the E1 reaction is that instead it removes a proton from carbon number one. It removes a proton from carbon one and then we form a bond between carbon one and carbon two. Okay, so let's map out all the steps and exactly what happens in this sequence. Maybe arrow by arrow. So our first step is the leaving group leaves. So that 
bond arrow A, that's what's happening there. And then next, we're forming a bond between oxygen and hydrogen, we'll call that arrow B, oxygen and hydrogen. And arrow C, we are breaking carbon hydrogen and we're forming carbon to carbon pi bond. And one thing that's interesting about this reaction, just like in the SN1 where this step is fast, this step is also fast. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's just draw out actually where the orbitals are, just to make this maybe a little bit more clear in case, in case it's not totally clear what's happening here. Let's just draw everything out. So let's remember our carbon here is tetrahedral and we have a carbocation present here and, and this is going to be a p orbital. Remember in our carbocation we're going to have a p orbital. And the p orbital is going to line up uh, like uh, just straight up and down along in the same plane as our carbon hydrogen bond. So that when our water comes along and when this proton is, is removed this pair of electrons from the carbon hydrogen bond is going to we, we draw the arrow like this but really what's going to happen is this ends up this pair of electrons ends up becoming the p orbital in our alkene and because we have a pair of electrons it's going to be shared between these two carbons uh, as the reaction progresses these two hydrogens are going to be in the same plane as the carbon. These are both sp2 hybridized carbons and we form our, our pi bond here between these two lobes. So this carbon hydrogen bond that breaks ends up becoming a, a p orbital and it's forming a pi bond with the adjacent p orbital from our carbocation. Okay, so a little more about the observations we see in this reaction. We find that the rate of the reaction is also unimolecular. Well, the, the rate determining step is unimolecular. What that means is that the rate is equal to our rate constant times only the concentration of our substrate. So RCl. And the concentration of water is irrelevant for the rate of this reaction. So it's only this. So again, this means that it's unimolecular. And since it's an elimination, we form it's an elimination, and it's unimolecular, we use the name E1 to distinguish the name of this reaction. So it's called the E1 reaction. And now, just like the SN1 reaction, which is closely related to, the slow step is we lose the leaving group. So we're forming a carbocation. So carbocation stability is key. And remember how carbocation stability works. We always, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, which are much more stable than primary. And, and we'll find the rate for the E1 reaction is also tertiary is faster than secondary, which is faster than primary. So comparing the SN1 and the E1 reaction, we find that normally at room temperature, uh, the SN1 reaction tends, tends to dominate. Uh, however, and they do have a lot of, uh, sorry, they do have a lot of things in common. They are unimolecular. It all is dependent on carbocation stability and tertiary is faster than secondary, which is faster than primary. And there's one little interesting tidbit about the E1 that, that favors, if you had to favor the E1 over the SN1 reaction, and we can talk about this in a, in a subsequent video, but the E1 reaction tends to be favored by heat. Tends to be favored by heat. So normal temperatures, you'll find that the SN1 pathway dominates, um, but at, uh, at, at lower, at higher temperatures, you'll, sorry, you'll find that the alkene the elimination products start to become more and more significant. So that's the E1 reaction. It's uh, important for tertiary alkyl halides. It goes through a carbocation. It's competitive with the SN1 reaction and it's also found with the SN1 reaction. It's unimolecular rate constant. The slow step is the loss of the leaving group. The fast step is deprotonation. And uh, from there, 
uh, we'll talk in the next video about how to, how to further compare the rates of SN1 and E1 reactions.